This is definitely a significant, uh, significant debris field, much more so than the Akagi or the Yorktown that we've dove on the last few days. And again, we appreciate your questions, your comments, your knowledge, as Jim pointed out from from Silver Spring, Maryland. There's uh, there's some expertise in the room, but there's uh, also a lot that is not known. Um, and we appreciate all those viewers and explorers, historians tuning in, sharing their knowledge with us. All of you out there who are curious, explorers want to know more, maybe learning about this for the first time. Um, appreciate your questions. Those of you who have connections, many of our Many of our communities, many of our relatives, some of our fathers and grandfathers, great grandfathers were were present or deeply connected to these battles and we honor them and your stories and your relationship. No. So what was wrong was the gains on the auto heading and it was making it go like wacky. So I've fixed that, so it's now it's steady. So no, I think he has just the gain or not. Is that right? That's Robert Waters taking uh, taking our compass headings and all of us from uh, from wacky to right, getting us fixed up here, oriented on this on this vessel and uh, dealing with a few little technical hiccups associated with uh, deep sea exploration and um, this front row bringing us great images, incredible view of the stern that we had. We'll slowly start making our way up the, up the starboard side of Kaga. Many of our viewers uh, tuning in to camera number three and uh, the sonar, the sonar scan. And, uh, can see our position relative to the ship coming up in sonar, uh, as well as uh, some sort of objects at elevation and strong, but perhaps some part of the debris field. Uh, off the starboard side. Of course, fellow explorers and colleagues from the United States, Japan, and Hawaii, uh, all represented here, but also over a dozen other countries, many other time zones, say approaching close to 20 of the world's time zones uh, represented, uh, exploring with us live on the call. And um, the power of telepresence bringing the deep sea and this historic survey to life for so many so that we can learn together. Amazing gift of, of the Nautilus and this technology and the ocean.
We, we do have a confirmed Rennie sighting uh, in the control van. Always nice to see <laughs> Rennie and help, helping us out, helping us out with the maps and uh, his amazing talent. To he put us down on all three shipwrecks. Drop, knows. Dropping us with, uh, dropping us with precision, with grace, <laughs> which will come as no surprise to anyone listening in who knows Rennie. So a question for Mike and or the shore team, what sort of uh, structure are we looking at right now? It looks like this is um, hull plating that's collapsed. Um, I'm not entirely sure it's, that is, looks like the interior of it. So I'm not really, I think it may have fallen over from uh, its position. Like it may have been on the deck above and it fell like almost it just kind of fell uh, outward. 100, 180, yeah. Yeah, it does look like an interior uh, sort of structure. Or the interior of a structure, to put it clearly. I believe we're back in the area of the machine engineering space that's where we were earlier and just off to one side of it, where we've got structural elements from the, from the hull, some plating. The bottom of the hull is in the sediment. Yeah. All right, thank you. But again, until we get right up close to it, looking at it just in context, it could be a section deck, it could be a section of hull. If it's hull, it's very, very light yeah. structure there. This would have been- But I'm looking at- no, yeah, go ahead. Looking at the big heavy as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think this would have been the forward section of the hangar deck, or one of the hangar decks. Mike, our shore side. Is there any indication where the you know debris from the flight deck might have been, or is is that uh, some of it lost at the surface and sort of scattered upon uh, upon sinking? Or do so we... yeah. So um, there's a lot of that debris that would have that's going to be on the seabed uh, at the location that the um, the ship was bombed, uh, which is quite a ways from here because it the engine stayed on and it so it had power and then drifted once that stopped before being scuttled. Um, so the Nauticos expedition in 1999, they found parts of Kaga identified, um, and I uh, we're pretty sure that that's the location that they found. Um, and so, so th there, there's that, and then there's probably bits of debris uh, in a line, and then we have the main hull here. Got it. Got it. Thank you. One of the things that we've been seeing, and let's just take a moment to compare Akagi to Kaga, with the understanding that we've not seen as much of Kaga as we did with the Kagi. That transition from ship to shipwreck began, of course, with the battle. And as bombing hits happened, as secondary explosions took place, as fuel ignited and blew up and closed spaces, as ordnance went off, a fair amount of damage was going to happen, as well as a fair amount of distortion from the heat. With that, we certainly saw a fair amount of that type of evidence yesterday on the Kagi. But in that, we were also able to see where we knew where hits had taken place, such as, you know, Dick Best 1,000-pound bomb striking uh, the deck there, close to a midships on Akagi. You could actually see the results of that in this nearly volcanic-style crater that represented both the hit and then the subsequent 
burning in and around there and the collapse of the deck around it. What we also have to configure with all of this is that with hot steel, with damage, cracks, as these vessels then sink, particularly after the torpedo hits fired to scuttle them by the Japanese struck amidships, that uh, hull is going to start to break off, break away. Some of it deformed, perhaps made brittle because of the heat and then the cold water hitting it. You've got a mix of factors that lead to a site looking exactly as what we're seeing now is a jumble that really requires a fair amount of forensic investigation. One of the challenges that we face in doing this type of work is, of course, the natural inclination is, and as anybody knows who watches, say, a CSI episode as a rerun or any other crime show, when you look at evidence, you're asking questions, you're posing hypotheses, you're going back and forth and discussing this with your colleagues. And many of you, I'm sure, I'm certain, have heard us all say, what about this, what about that? and then realizing, no, nah, that's not quite it, and then we are revising our opinions. Uh, that's why the police generally don't like when you're having a crime scene investigation to have a reporter there, because more often than not, your first impression could be right, but it could also just as well be wrong. That's the benefit as well as the, of having all of this data recorded and being able to go back through it with a little more time uh, to assess it and to document. And so with that, uh, we're still trying to sort all this out. There's obviously evidence there. And again, coming back to what we said earlier, I know that there's some of you out there who probably have a clearer sense of this because you've studied it and know these details. I also, just having seen something come through the science chat, want to acknowledge exactly what Russ Matthews has said. And that is that the description of the damage that we're talking about as detailed in John Parshall and Tony Tuttle Tully's shattered sword is indeed absolutely harrowing. What, while we take a very forensic look at this, let us not for a moment forget the absolute hellishness on all of these vessels that were hit on both sides as crews fought to save themselves and to save their crewmates and to save their ships. And what we look at this forensic evidence it's also a reminder of what those moments were like for them, now cold and in the dark of the sea, but back then in the midst of fire and terror, but also incredible acts of bravery as these guys fought on either side to save each other and to save their ships. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Absolutely. Mahalo, Jim. Yeah. We are looking at auto heading off. the hull and remains of Kaga. Um, just yesterday and the day before, had the privilege and honor, humbling privilege and honor of diving down to have first ever eyes on Akagi, another Japanese aircraft carrier sunk at the Battle of Midway and, and just the day and two days before that, uh, the USS Yorktown, uh, the American aircraft yeah. carrier sunk at that battle. So far, three ships. And the hose reel. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I love it. So, the compass is so not one of the things that we just spotted, what we think we're seeing here, is just coming in the bottom of the frame on the left-hand side. This probably is a section of oh, hanger, and that looks to be a hose reel. There, you see it between yeah. those two frames? Yeah, we do. Can we zoom in again? Yep, zoom in. And you're talking about the hose reel that's against the back here. There it is. Just the left corner, yeah? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Wow. My dad was a firefighter. He's going to be so proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible.
Jim and, and Shoreside, uh, what's, uh, what's the effects of, of pressure over time on, uh, on ships of this size and, and built in this way? What, is, uh, what does the pressure at these depths mean for uh, structural integrity and, and, and the breakdown over time, these kind of, sh these kind of aircraft carriers? Well, it certainly depends on the material, right? And you can see there's different, all different kinds of medium uh, that's being used for different parts of the ship. And depending on how how those material came to the bottom of the ocean based on site formation process, battle, whether it was battle damage or it was natural deformation, um, they can certainly be in different states of, of preservation and, and likewise decay at different rates. Um, also, the, like, there's alloys in the metal. As, as Shauna from Naval History and Heritage Command was sharing with us yesterday, that just because it's metal doesn't mean it's all the same, and they all yeah. degrade at different different levels. And as for me, I don't know, and that's how everybody knows that I'm a, I am an honest person. <laughs> yep. We appreciate your honesty, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. And it, make, it makes sense that all these materials are going to respond differently, uh, different alloys. Um, yeah, some are more corrosion resistant than others. Uh, some stand up well in salt water, some not. Uh, just as an FYI to shore team, uh, Mike's grabbing something to eat real quick, and uh, Hans had to step away for um, something else briefly. So um, we're, we're going to rely on you for a few minutes. <laughs> so if you ask us any questions, you're going to get a lot of honesty. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. If you guys can back out a little bit on the Zoom, Alexis thought he, he may have spotted a casemate gun barrel below this overlapping structure that's falling. So that's it would be below light. this. Is that it? In oh, the yeah. Lower, the, in the lower right corner. Oh, yeah. Is it a gun barrel that we might be looking at that's kind of coming into center screen? If so, uh, Phil owes Alexis $5. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, because you can almost see the, the next one first forward. Yeah, I think it's yeah, yeah, great eye. Good eye. Great eye. Yes, yeah, that's one of the case made guns. Uh, all right. Okay, right, everybody. Stay up to Alexis. Do you want to zoom in on that? Yes, if you could zoom in on that, that would be great. Alright, video, can we zoom? Okay, zoom in. Yeah, look, see? Look at the look at the frame, see the structure there. That's, that's definitely this is how light what light is built. Hello. Yes, go Hello. ahead. It's got something on the end of it. I don't know. That's yeah, that looks like an attachment, doesn't it? Yeah. It almost looks like a blank for a flange or something like that. Right, right. Like bolts. It looks like it has bolts on it. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what I'm seeing too. All right. Give me your money back. Hey, hey. Okay, everybody, give you give me money back to Alexis. All right, Alexis, you need to give it. <laughs> what is that? All right, thanks for the Zoom member. Okay, we're good. Coming out. Yeah, it's full wide. Well, what's that over there? See that over there? I think so. I might get a brick when you see other than a player. Yeah. Right. No, so you've got there. That's the pipe. That's the pipe. And see, it's partially crushed. That's the gun. It's oriented almost the way it's around. So that's the pipe. Is that the right corner? You guys should have a telestrator there too if you wanted to. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can see that, but is this it? Yeah, we can see it. 
Okay. It's in our upper right view. So there's a, in, see, see the question in, in the pipe? But there's the gun. I think there's the gun. They were the gun. This, this area looks like it took extensive, extensive damage, battle mm -hmm. damage. Yeah, I'm seeing some portholes partially blown out. Yes, well, you see where that porthole is actually been uh, surrounded with it's been pushed out. Can you see what that was white is? We saw it on a casemate shield and also the portholes. Like that whole string of portholes there is all open. It does, doesn't it? Begs the question of whether that was uh, intentional or whether that was a product of uh, some battle damage. Battle conditions and we have portholes open. Shore side, does it? Uh on either side of those portholes, is it are those stanchions we're looking at, or those are are those in fact guns? What's your what's your take on that? I think that the one directly below the porthole that's blocked out is not a gun, but is pipe of some sort. Um, it looks partially crushed. However, yeah. up against the hull at an angle more up into the higher corner, that is the case that does appear to be one of the casemate guns. Casemate guns, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you can see there's a slight flare to the barrel end as opposed to sort of the flange that you see on the edge of the pipe. Mm -hmm. And again, for those of you tuning in, the earlier history of these vessels as ships built to fight ships that were then modified to become aircraft carriers. This is for an all gun shootout which every Navy had trained to do and the type of war they thought they would fight until World War II. There were those ahead of that, Billy Mitchell in the U.S. and others, who thought that naval aviation would be the way the future wars would be fought. And indeed, here we are, ironically, looking at guns, a former battle cruiser, converted into an aircraft carrier at the battle that definitively showed that the age of the big gunship was over, as if it hadn't already been figured out, of course, and this Pearl Harbor and Toronto demonstrated. But here, particularly, an artifact of another age, the casemate gun, right here, alongside the hull, the lower hull, of Chaga, as it had been before it was converted into a carrier. We it will be done. Yeah, the whole ship tells the story of a a larger story of a major transformation in, in naval warfare. That's right. Thank you, Jim. Yes, thank you. All right, can we zoom in? Okay, zooming in. All right, we're going to get you a zoom on those details there. So you can see the end of the barrel. When it goes back, what you're also going to see uh, is where it goes into the actual casemate, the turret of that casemate itself. Russ Matthews points out surviving examples of casemate gun positions can be seen on the Japanese Museum battleship Nikata in Yokosuka. Yeah, I, I had the honor or privilege of being taking a tour of that. You can also see earlier casemate guns uh, on board well, the casemates themselves, uh, the actual the guns are gone on board Texas. So there. Sorry. There, there's place right in there. some of the casemates. Um, I've also seen them diving when we took a look at them on the uh, USS Nevada. And Olympia has an earlier example of these as well. This is a really good view, guys. Thank you. We're coming right up. You can see where the barrel goes in. The 
No, it's a great view. Thank you, ROV navigation video video team. Massive casemate gun designed for ship to ship warfare. Um, made much less relevant by the by the shift to naval naval air warfare. Uh, okay, coming took, wide. Yeah, this is also an area where we're seeing quite a bit of uh, rustical growth. If you keep moving along this hull, you should see other, other, other casemates. Wondering how many individuals would it take to operate a gun of that size? I'm going to go ahead and call in another move. Ellis, we concur. If you do another move and we head further forward, we should start to encounter other guns. One of our viewers says that this, these 8-inch casemate guns uh, on the Kaga and Akagi uh, weren't their original battleship and battle cruiser designs, but uh, sort of added later as a emergency surface defense. Um, uh, that they hoped never had to be used, but uh, they were navies were still at this time worried about damage that they might be inflicted by other surface warships. That's uh, at least some insight uh, being shared with us by by viewer online. Well, that's a good point. Uh, with that reminder that not everybody in these navies accepted the doctrine that the age of uh, the big gun or the gun was over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the number of or one era battleships that survived Pearl Harbor were brought back into service, ended up supporting landing and doing shore bombardment, and not the all-out sea battle. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see these here, and thank you for writing that in. That's much appreciated. And just FYI, short team, uh, we have uh, Mike back with us, and uh, Hans should be with us again pretty soon. Hello. What are those characters that we can see? Do we do we know? Don't call us characters. <laughs> we're, your, we're your lead scientists. You are a character, Mike. You are. You talk about those white little marks on the wall? Yeah, there were some uh, Japanese characters there, but I'm not sure. I'm... Were they really? I yeah. think so. They look yeah. right here to the bottom left. In the bottom left of the screen. Um, yeah. yeah. Huh. Good spot. I may also be seeing what I want to see. Those could perhaps not be characters, but just some other. Uh, yeah, some, they, they look like circles, like a whole bunch of little circles. I'm not sure what that is, though. Can we zoom in? Okay, zooming in. Good. Quite a bit of heave. Now. We are. Um, we're on the starboard yeah. side, uh, making our way up the, uh, our, uh, towards the bow. Tension meter back up. You gotta switch to engineer. Oh, it's a nice view, actually. Looking back towards the stern on the starboard side. Yeah, that really gives you a sense of how some of that plating we saw earlier, uh, some of that hole collapsed. Okay, continuing zoom. Yeah, it doesn't look like characters. It looks like circles, like you were saying, Mike. Is that structural? It's hard to, it's hard to see well, through the rest. Yeah, just... Go ahead. Randy, go meet you up.
It is, and it's good to hear your voice. We are alongside Kaga, looking at a section of a uh, hangar that has blown over, close to the 8-inch casemate gun. And you're oh. welcome. And just a little forewarning for our audience, we're coming up on a watch change in about uh, 10 minutes. Look at how that plating is just shattered. I think that's actually the barrel of one of the casemate guns, isn't it? It is, yeah. Sorry if I missed that earlier. No don't worries. Be, don't be sorry, but uh, yeah. We've got to uh, keep our uh, science co-lead fueled up. Yeah. Mike, what are those ports right there on the barrel, on the right? I don't, I, I don't know. That's a good question. That, that would have all been internal. That might be where it's loaded. It's a guess. I'm not a arms expert, but that's a total guess. I'm not a legs expert either, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You should apologize for that. You should yeah. apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> Team, such an incredible honor to serve on watch with you again. This was... Uh, the one and only eight to twelve. Uh, it's I know Mike's been on uh, almost all of our watches along with Hans. They're they're supposed to be taking turns, but they're having a hard time uh, doing that. But to all of our regular eight to twelve crew, this sacred time together, I really appreciate it. And uh, soon to be signing off, handing over to the next uh, amazing twelve to four watch as well. And. Um, Hope you guys will stay with us as we move, continue to move slowly up the starboard side of Kaga, uh, conducting a survey. Uh, we've already seen the team have to overcome a few technical wide. challenges. Yep, go ahead. Uh, keeping our ROV safe. Uh, making an incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging exploration look, look easy. So thank you, thank you front row, you guys were awesome. Thank you, Kukui, our master yes. data logger, our light, our beacon of knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Mahina, yes. uh, all the EK you brought and Manao you're bringing into this exploration with us and to our whole science team yes. um, for helping us figure out what we're looking at and help tell this story and honor, honor all of the people impacted and affected and the mm -hmm. legacy of hope and peace that it tells. Aloha. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Daniel, for facilitating these yeah. conversations. Yes, most definitely. Thank you, everyone. Everyone, all of our support, all of our partners, everyone in the control van. It's a cockle effort.
So, Mike, Hans, yeah. you guys can see that the, there's only the barbette for the next gun. Yeah, I, I was literally just going to say that. <clears throat> just like on the other side, we're missing one of the one of the casemates here. And it looks like the deck above collapsed. We'll see if, if there's more of them um, as we go along. Zooming in. This is what we're looking at. What's fallen over on this mic is, is I think it's the side of the hangar. Yeah, yeah, the, the wall of the hangar. Oh, wow. Just as an answer to an earlier question, um, we were looking at the base of that casemate gun and some insights coming in. It's part of the part of the recoil mechanism, um, and uh, oh, okay, that's cool. And reloading would have been uh, at the rear of that of that barrel inside the ship, but uh, yeah, as part of that, could have been a hydraulic system. I don't know. I, I guess it uh, depends on the specifics of the design of that casemate gun, but. Just, just to pop in some. Well, there's more great insight from all of our, uh, all the historical knowledge. Whatever that was, was electronic, because you can see plugs here. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. sure enough, yeah. I can't imagine the uh, effort it would take to wire a ship like this. And I mean, I'm sure it's even mm. worse now with uh, modern <clears throat> warships that are, that are this size, that they have to get electric, ethernet, <clears throat> Plumbing, all sorts. Of, I mean, this just must be a massive effort. Equivalent to Daniel saying about how you had to tie the your canoe together with like eight miles of uh, of line, but trying to wire, put electric cables all over these must be crazy too. Eight miles of electrical cable, <laughs> yeah. uh, funneling it through the ship. Yeah, that probably, would be quite probably the a lot more. extensively more than that. Yeah, it could I be mean, quite a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Nautilus is much more than eight miles of uh, they're, wiring they're being telepresence enabled. eight miles of wiring just in this control van. <laughs> probably, yeah. Can confirm. <laughs> that layer of telepresence that we have adds a lot onto the electronics in this ship. Yeah. But yeah I'm here, sure one of these uh, <clears throat> uh, ship enthusiasts knows the amount of the exact like distance of <laughs> line in these ships. Could be. But yeah, with the a ship that's in excess of about 800 feet long, the 100 yeah. some odd foot beam. That's a lot of wiring, a lot of infrastructure. Reach of the gun in position now. Mike, as this drops again, you can see there's the breach of the gun. Yeah. Okay, going full wide. Zoom. Back from lunch. All right, we're doing a video watch change mm. here. Thank you. You might have a few minutes, or you might want to wait and grab something later. Oh, gotcha. Right, right.
while the team is here finishing a watch t uh, change, uh, just wanted to, for situational awareness, you're watching live footage from, uh, we're now uh, midway through a 27-day expedition to explore some most remote areas in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, uh, the largest marine protected area in the United States and one of the largest in the world. Uh, and the objectives of this expedition is to uh, explore some of the most uh, dramatic places in the monument, some uh, areas of both cultural and natural significance. Uh, we have uh, dove uh, the last three days some some very uh, historically significant underwater under underwater cultural heritage sites. Uh, but throughout this expedition, we'll also be exploring some areas of natural uh, significance, several seamounts and. Uh, areas of both biological I haven't said and anything yet. geological significance. I hope you can join us uh, throughout the expedition. Mike and Hans, as we settle back in from the watch change, could you give us an, an update about kind of how the dive is progressing and where we find ourselves now here on the wreck? Hey, yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, and hey, everyone, good afternoon from uh, from the Pacific Ocean north of Hawaii in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, we dived uh, this morning. Uh, we're on the, the wreck of the Japanese aircraft carrier Kaga. Um, this was... Wreckage from it was found uh, in 1999 by Nauticos, and then this re the wreck was found uh, in 2019 by um, the, a research vessel, Petrol and Vulcan Inc. Uh, so we're diving on this for the second time because um, Vulcan got an ROV dive on it when they found it. Uh, we're looking to do uh, a full perimeter documentation and site characterization. So we, we came down on the port side of midships and we move aft to the stern, um, documenting as we go. We're, we're trying to stay kind of like where we are now, uh, a little bit above and, and about five meters back from the, the, the edge of the, of the wreck to, to get a good look. That's the best for the, for the lighting. And so we came around, we're, we're still aft, we're near the stern still, but we're coming up um, along the starboard side. We're looking at some casemate guns now. Well, this is the barbette for a missing one. Um, that were kind of along the lower hull. The, the wreck is pretty well buried um, above the waterline. 
in, in, the, in the sediment. And also much of the upper structure is missing uh, from the five bombs that uh, detonated on, on, the flight and on and through the flight deck, um, which set off a chain reaction of ordnance explosion um, at the time on June 4th, 1942. <clears throat> so we're seeing a, a fairly low relief shipwreck relative to Yorktown and Akagi that we did the last few days. Um, so we're going to just continue looking around um, as we continue down this starboard side to the bow. We expect that the uh, smokestack and the um, the island are are gone because uh, they were well, one of the bombs detonated right right on top of it. So uh, I think that was uh, destroyed uh, early on in the attack. Um, and then we're going to after we do that, we're going to uh, take a look at um, a large piece of debris that is off the starboard side, maybe a hundred meters away, uh, and see what that's that is as well. Yeah, and to that I'd add that the survey is going very well. Yep. I, I think we have good clarity of water. We're getting good coverage of the areas surveyed so far, and and the team and the ROV operators are doing an excellent job keeping us close to see what we need to see, but doing a non-invasive job and not contacting the wreck. So uh, we're very pleased. Nautilus Shore. Go ahead, Silver Shore. Nautilus Shore. If you look up at the top of the image, you can see the, the part of the casemate above, or you know, in this case, above in our image, but off to the side from the, uh, the barbette been displaced. Oh yeah, I see that. It's the uh, circular structure at the top of the screen. It looks like it's upside down though. Cool. You guys see that? Yep. So Mike, we're good. We're good with this and we're we're happy if you guys want to move a little further. Yeah, we're we're working on it. Um, we're going to be be moving very deliberately and slowly. Uh, so that we stay along this uh, this edge of the wreck. Understood. I know you've just had a ship change. Which way were you going, Mike? Port or starboard? Uh, left or right? But they from. We're going to be going to the right. To from the ROV's perspective. Yeah, to the right. Um, we've been going at about 305 degrees. No. And we we should do Makes small. No sense. No sense. <clears throat> well, we're, uh, we're looking one three five right now, so maybe I'm. Um, maybe I'm. The, the strike of the wreck is about one hundred and ten, so maybe I did the math wrong. One ten. They also said that the uh, the the headings have been inconsistent because we're next to a steel wreck. Around it. Okay. I'll leave it up to you. We're a little close. Mia, what there. are your thoughts? Um, I think, yeah, 305, you've, you've, you've been doing that for I the last meant, five moves. We have, okay, yeah. Um, I know you've been doing incremental, like 10 meters, 5 meters, 5 meters. Yeah, we we're, we like these smaller moves so that we don't get pulled off too far. Yeah. So yeah, yeah let's try 10 meters. Um, I think I think you guys have finished your last movement, so we can let me talk with oh maybe a little bit more, but um, I'll talk with Dan and when he's ready and you're ready. I'm ready. You're ready. Ready. Are you guys ready for another call? Yep. Alrighty. Bridge nav. Bridge nav. Uh, can we please move one zero meters bearing three oh five? Thank you. Have we been along here already or? 
This is our uh, first run, is it? I Mike? don't. I don't think so. This is our what? This is our first run along this side, is it? First so, run, yeah. So we don't know what's out there. Correct. So this is the th the third gun that is also missing. That that Barbette's uh, just just sitting here. Well, that's a good shot. Yeah, but it's an early photograph. There's only only three there, so yeah. prior to some modifications. So do we see any evidence of uh, why these have gone missing from their mounts? Um, no, but a, a lot of um, turrets are gravity seated, so they're not actually anchored. They're just, uh, they're sitting there of their own weight. And so when, when ship, uh, warships cap capsize, they'll um, often fall out. Gotcha, thank you. Mike, did you say we're going, we're on the stern side or still going around? Uh, are, we, are we still going around the stern or are we on the starboard side? We're on the starboard side. Okay, roger. It's really different, look how they routed that exhaust. Yeah. Just helping support uh, a little more background about this vessel, the aircraft carrier Kaga um, was built in a different, uh, for a different intended purpose before she was, uh, it was built as an aircraft carrier. Um, it was one of the Tosa class battleships when it was originally built and then converted um, to add the flight deck that uh, it would have had during the Battle of Midway. Beginning, it was uh, begun to be built in 1920, and so the ship had a long history before it came here in June 1942. Um, really, unbelievably large ships. You know, really important, I think, to to consider the scale of these vessels as we think about this battle in this place. Uh, 247 meters, over 800 feet long. Um, the ship had a complement of over 1,700 sailors after its reconstruction and was one of four Japanese aircraft carriers that were in the uh, attacked in this task force group. Mike, can you explain a little bit? Um, I want to make sure I'm describing that correctly. There was a second task force that had had moved into Alaska and also kind of been held in reserve, but is that the right description for four in this task force? There are quite a few actually. The, the, almost the entire Japanese Navy was sent out for, for some portion of the, the Midway Offensive. Um, so that, yeah, they began with a, a small force um, attacking Kiska and I think Kotka Island uh, in, in the Aleutian Islands as kind of a distraction. Um, then there were two carrier groups uh, Akagi and Kaga were together, and Horiyu and Sur Suryu were together. Hiryu and Suryu were together, um, and then there were, and they had support ships, What's that? Uh, destroyers, uh, and then there was. Um, I think we're all right. Then there was a, a battleship uh, and other support ship uh, task force that that never actually made it up to the location of the battle with the carriers. Um, they they were off elsewhere. Um, and that's where Admiral Yamamoto was uh, for, for, for this offensive. Yeah, the landing force was kind yeah. of held in reserve, you know, so the aircraft carriers could make sure there was no air opposition, which, you know, could really decimate the landing force. So they never got close. Yeah. Yeah, so they'd intended to land and occupy Midway, and which is why they never bombed the actual airstrip, only the buildings and anti-aircraft gunner gun locations because um, they wanted to use the airstrip and they would have they were going to bring a whole bunch of support like infrastructure uh and and people and and ships to to hold the island but then yeah they never got there right the model is short side yeah we have a special guest with us would you uh take a few moments to say hello to admiral sam, sam cox from navy History and Heritage Commander, the director. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, uh, Admiral Cox. It's uh, it's good to have you here. 
Hey, I, I just wanted to say thank you for the, the work that you're doing here. This is uh, absolutely awesome. Uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to be on Petrol when we found the Watt. Uh, but this is this is uh, this is just amazing. And uh, I think we'll we'll learn things that we didn't know before. Uh, and certainly, it's an opportunity to get this out to the American public uh, so that they can understand what you know our Navy has done for them in the past. Uh, and also understand the valor and sacrifice, you know, on both sides uh, in battle, which was which was pretty incredible. So I just want to say thanks for the great job that you're doing. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, and uh, and and thanks for uh, coming by and and watching. Yeah, thank you, Admiral. We we couldn't agree more. There's important historical and archaeological information here that tells the story and allows us to understand these sites as they change over time, but we're very aware of the, the nature of this, this violent conflict that occurred and the loss of life and uh, are as respectful as we can to, to honor those who were lost. Thank you, Admiral Cox, for your response and some comments. We uh, just wanna also echo and reinforce how special it is to be able to be sharing these places, these stories, these sites with uh, interested people around the world. So whether they're interested in the ocean, their interest in the cultural significance of Papahanaumokuakea, uh, their interest in the military history or the personal narratives of uh, so many people where this was a defining moment in their lives are here with us. So as we stream this, of course, we have viewers uh, in the United States and in Japan uh, we welcome all of you and encourage you to come to Nautilus Live and share your stories, your connections to these places, mm. but also uh, viewers all over the world, Brazil and Finland, in Hungary and Ireland and Italy and the Netherlands, uh, waking up and going to sleep with us across Europe, Norway and Belgium and Palau and Guam. Uh, thank you all for being here and we're so pleased to be able to bring this history to life for you and with you. Uh, you know, these ships, too, they, these are hallowed sites uh, deserving of the same respect that in the United States we would give to Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, you know, these sailors have no headstones at the sea, uh, and this is a memorial to their sacrifice and uh, deserves to be treated uh, with the utmost respect on you know, both Japanese and American. Uh, none of these sailors had any choice in having to go to war, and they all did their duty, and uh, you know we just need to respect that. And I appreciate that uh, you're carrying on in that manner. Thank you for that. And as our, our Japanese colleague reminded us yesterday, June Kimura, that many were very young, in their 20s. So it's quite a moving mission to understand these places. Nautilus Shoreside. Yep. The administrator of NOAA is here, he wants to say hello. That's what you, sir. Yeah, Nautilus crew, this is Rick Spinner at a uh, standing here in the uh, command center, I actually was last in this facility probably 15 years, something like that. And I've got to tell you, it's just extraordinary to see this footage and, and to see the fruits of the labor of everyone here. Uh, I certainly want to echo the last comment we heard. This is a somber time. This is a time where we want to honor the lives lost and uh, respect uh, everything that this site represents. But I also want to personally thank you for the hard work. I've spent a lot of time at sea. I know these glorious moments that we get to celebrate with distinguished guests are the culmination of many hundreds and hundreds of hours of hard work, of survey, of getting the tech right and the engineering right. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you all are doing. And I look forward to being able to share the 
the imagery that we've got right now, as well as some of the stories that uh, everyone has to tell with the guests that are gathering here in Silver Spring. Thank you. Uh, back over to you. Thank you very much. Nav, how is our move coming? I was just going to call and say we're almost done. So okay. if you guys are ready for another yeah, one we can, zero. Yeah, we can do another 10 meters. Thank you. Are you ready, Dan? Wait, wait till she's done. Bridge, Nav. Yeah, this piece, this curved piece that's yeah. bent outwards. Uh, John on the science chat was thinking it was either decking flopped outwards or top. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, it's, it's strange. Like it, it doesn't have room to have fit like adjacent to and against the, the barbette. Right. Um, and there wasn't, or was there a lip? Maybe it was vertical and the it was poking out over it. John Parshall was, was going either way with that, too. We're not sure. No. There wasn't really deck that came up. Either All right. I just uh, called in the, the change. Thank you. Either that or it's pushed up. Yeah, it and could it's be. it's bent down, but I don't know what that curve would be below the casemate. And that's, that's yeah. down to the water line. It's almost like right. this. Yeah, I don't know. We could actually see where the thousand pound bomb punched through the deck. Hey, team, just a heads up. The, uh, yeah. you know, the, the fourth aftermost case made. Incredible. It's a gun interview. Just a reminder that just came on in and that close hit. to well, the one. So where that first 500 pound we bomb like went through. That, that hole. Was... Yeah, I agree with what John's saying that uh, it wasn't vertical, it was flat, and then. It, it had been folded over and it unfolded a full 180, but I'm just not quite sure how it fit against the barbette, but oh, it looks like another mm -hmm. one's missing. I think we only might have one of the casemate guns remaining, the farthest aft one, because here's a third barbette that's empty with and other debris on it. Right. And maybe that debris is related to that, that blast, although it's all, all three damaged. As we look at this place, I thank you so much, Administrator Spinrad and Admiral, Admiral Cox for your statements. I want to honor and also uplift the importance of Kapahanaumokuakea um, as the realm of Po and as a sacred space, in addition to the layers and layers of this history that we're adding on by understanding more about the Battle of Midway and what happened here. Um, Malia, would you like to introduce yourself and share some about this space? Sure thing. Mahalo, Megan. Aloha to all of you. It is such a pleasure and a privilege um, to be in this space, this um, sacred realm, this Aina Akua. Aina Akua meaning um, the place where our ancestors and where our deities live and dwell. And so it's a pleasure to be here, um, to be able to interact with the environment, um, interact with our colleagues who are on, on board the ship, Nautilus, and also all of you that are um, on shore that have joined us in this very collaborative effort to, um, to understand the significance of this place, um, to raise awareness of it, and to really um, come here with a, a state of reverence and a, a state of um, gratefulness for those who have um, been a part of um, the Battle of Midway. And so, you know, from a Hawaiian perspective, as a Kanako O'ivi, I work for NOAA. Um, I work on behalf of Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And we have a deep kuleana as native people. Um, kuleana meaning responsibility, but also a privilege um, to be able to work in this indigenous space, to work in this sacred realm, um, and to honor 
the long lasting legacy um, that our ancestors um, created, developed, and maintained in these Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And so for us to be here exploring, we're continuing the legacy of our ancestors, um, some of the mo greatest explorers in the world who journeyed across the largest ocean, the Pacific Ocean, which we in Polynesia call Moana Nui Akea. They traveled to the most isolated archipelago in the world, and we honor that depth and breadth of that voyaging legacy, and we honor those today who are on a, on a modern ship who are doing the exploration like our ancestors did. And so, you know, that weaving of past, present, and future, the weaving of traditional indigenous knowledge with modern science, you know, it just creates this very robust way of viewing the world, of taking care of this sacred place and understanding the, the ecosystems that are part of this very sacred aina. So we have been so privileged to be here to interact with the realm of Kanaloa, our god of the sea, to see what Kanaloa is revealing to us through these um, shipwrecks. What can we learn from history so we don't repeat history? You know, what are the lessons that we can take back and, and tell um, the public about the incredible work that's being done? So we are just so honored to be here and to honor, you know, the, the fallen, you know, from both countries. We honor our um, Japanese sailors and airmen. We honor our American sailors and airmen who gave the ultimate sacrifice and have added to the sanctity of this place and um, the reasons why we take care of Papahana Mokuakea is because of those kind of connections and relationships. So just a privilege and an honor to be here at this moment in time, viewing things that you know human eyes rarely see and being able to um, work together collaboratively across the ocean when we think about the ocean, it doesn't divide us. The ocean connects us. And so we send aloha um, to all of you, wherever you may be in the world. And um, just take this as a moment to reflect on our relationship with our ecosystems, with our lands, with our waters, and with each other. So aloha nui to all of you, and um, just so honored to be here in this sacred space. Mahalo, Malia, and thank you, you know, mahalo over and over again for uh, all of your leadership in guiding us as we learn about this place and in leading our protocol um, in different ways that we've honored these places before we enter. And also before and after each dive, as we as we take time to um, understand and honor the gravity of the opportunity to be in this place. Mike and Hans, are there are there elements to your to your eye as you look yeah. at the scene here? What what are you seeing? Uh, Nautilus, shore side. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. We have representatives from the Embassy of Japan with us now. Uh, does anybody like to speak to the ship? Okay. Uh, can I just speak here? Yes, please. Oh, okay. they, they can hear you. <laughs> well, I'm so overwhelmed, so. Uh, so how 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 is how is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a simple question, but uh, how do you feel now? That's uh, a wonderful time, I guess. 
Yeah, hello. Um, thank you for, for being here. We're, um, we're right now on the, uh, on the starboard side of uh, the aircraft carrier Kaga, the shipwreck. Um, and we're, we're looking at the, the empty barbette where one of the casemate guns used to be. Uh, and we're going to be making our way very slowly along the starboard side towards the bow and documenting um, the battle damage and the damage from sinking and how it's uh, settled into the mud and looking for um, just to see the general condition uh, of this wreck. Speaking with you is Dr. Michael Brennan. He's one of the co-lead scientists on board the vessel. With him is archaeologist Hans von Tilburg ashore. Today we have already spoken with Randall Sasaki. The other day, Jun Kimura was also on, and we've also heard from Akefumi Iwabuchi. Uh, Mike and Hans, one of the things that I think would probably be important for you to relay is just what we were talking about, which is the sense that everybody has had uh, of, with just the power, the impact of diving on this on this wreck, as well as Akagi and Yorktown. Yeah, I can... Would you uh, mind sharing that? Yeah, thank you, Jim. It's... Um, well, well, first of all, this is an, an incredibly special mission to have the capacity to do. And there's a wealth of information here to understand this pivotal battle. But to be honest with you, and, and I think I speak for some others as well, it's not an easy thing to see these sites because, in a sense, seeing what's happened to these shipwrecks, we're reliving some of the of the violence of the conflict and the catastrophic engagement that was the battle of midway and i can tell you for myself you know it's uh, it brings up a lot of feelings that beyond the mission time frame itself when i get back to my home on oahu will take me some time to deal with frankly um it's very sobering and we understand we're looking at locations where sailors and airmen lost their lives almost instantaneously sometimes. And so it's, it's important that we honor that and remember that. And the cultural protocols and the staff we have on board to help us understand the larger meaning of this place, Papahanao Mokuakea, is helping me to deal with some of those feelings. So there's a sadness to these sites. They're very striking. And I don't think any of us will ever forget them. Uh, but it does bring up feelings of what a, what a horrible conflict that was. And I hope we don't end up having to create more of these sites underwater. Well said, Hans. Sure. This is Rick Spinrad again. I wonder if you can comment at all on the nature of the de degradation, the rusticles, and any other uh, chemical erosion or activity on the whole compared with what we've seen in other similar wrecks. Is there anything different in these wrecks here with respect to the uh, environmental impact? Yeah, there. Uh, they're, they're similar to other deep water wrecks in that we're seeing the steel corroding uh, in the form of rusticles, and you can see some of them in the in the in the image right now, especially uh, draping off that background uh, piece of wreckage. Um, and, and a lot of the steel uh, shows that, it's like other deep water sites like Titanic and Bismarck, uh, and all three ships, uh, Yorktown, Kaga, and Akagi, have shown that. Um, What's also interesting, though, is that uh, we were, when we were just at the stern, a lot of the decking, the wooden decking, is still there. And on, on Yorktown, that was the same. Um, so despite some, some of the uh, raging fires that, that were across these uh, ships, some of the wooden planking uh, is preserved and were deeper and a little colder than some of those wood-boring organisms will be living. So, so they've uh, preserved quite well. Um, so we're seeing a, a bit of a differences uh, across the sites in terms of preservation. What's interesting for some of us who've also been on Titanic is Titanic is far more colonized with the bacteria that creates the rust sickles. And there's a sense that, you know, give another 20 years, we might see that same level of change with these sites. But with that, I mean, one thing we should also note, even if not that, is this metal is also still painted. 
And so we still have paint adhering to the number of these surfaces, except in areas where there's been fire. And with that, particularly on Yorktown and on Akagi, we've seen areas where the fire has burned intensely and the metal has changed as a result of that heat. And so with that, the one thing that's important, all of the work that we do, of course, is not only focused on heritage and understanding and cultural connection, but also how these relate to the ocean environment and how that changes over time and what that means for the ocean environment as well. If we are to see sites where in the past decisions were made to sink things, say, with other types of weapons now banned, that we're looking at wrecks that have oil, but also just the basic understanding of an environment that we know so little about as opposed to what we know about space or the moon, for example. And in this case, I think powerfully, as we've seen this, the fact that we are here looking at the remains of a ferocious battle of 81 years ago with very dear friends who were once fighting against us, I think is a reminder of within the shortness of our own lives how things can change and how important it is for us to we'll always have dialogue and to be friends. So, all right, because I'm not. Hey, Mike and Hans. Yeah, go ahead. If you guys are ready, um, I was just discussing with Dan, maybe doing a move at a bearing at 315 to get us, we're kind of drifting into the wreck. Sure, yep. Does that sound good? Yep. At 10 meters? Yep. You Bridge can maybe do it a little bit more steep than that, like 325, 350, or five, yeah, a little bit steeper than 315, um, to, if it's only 10 meters. So, Mike, you're going to continue to move forward? Yeah, correct. Roger. Okay. We're moving to which direction? We're moving towards the bow now. About. So, so we are in these plans. We have we were at the stern, and now we are moving. We are just past the deep cave um, here. Yeah. So we're moving in this direction with what you know was. A very large ship, the very end of the stern is gone, and we have the bow is deep in the mud. So we have not been able to see a lot of that. And most of this, I mean, what we really are looking at is this to the hull. The portion of this folded over and was here, and we passed that. And you see a little bit of it there. But for the most part, we take this slowly and we circle hulls, we go over them. There are two other areas on the site that we likely will not be able to see because they're far away, and that is everything that came off of the homes. With Akagi, it was much closer. With Yorktown, everything was basically there. But here, there seems to have been some drift where a large amount from the sonar data, a large amount of Kaga is off more than a ship's distance away. And there's a larger piece off to the other side, maybe. Again, portion of the hangar, but we don't know until we go. Oh, it's been about uh, eight years uh, in, in the battle and also, However, for the deep first in circumstances for 18 years, it's not so long. No, no, it's not. I mean, I, you know. It's amazing what does preserve them in the ocean environment, and that's something we continue to learn. When I was working with colleagues of, of, um, of Fukuoka and the Ginko shipwrecks, um, Mongol invasion of Japan in 1271, the helmet of a Mongol soldier nicely preserved, along with the remains of his armor and his bowl with his name on it, Wang, Centurion. So that was preserved, but the iron from the, the crossbow bolts was completely corroded. Oh. It was right, right off of Takashima, right outside of Fukuoka, where the, the Ginko, the second, the Ginko. So we're kind of 50 feet. 40 feet. Even 
in really low low visibility warm. Tomorrow day. Okay. Yeah, hello. Thank everyone. you. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to uh, a big thank you to our guests, uh, Admiral Cox, uh, Dr. Spinrad, and our uh, friends uh, at the Japanese Embassy. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of the 49 people here on board Exploration and Vessel Nautilus that are part of the Ala Omawana Kaiuli expedition and there are close to 200 people on shore that have been supporting this mission. Just want to thank you so much also for everything that you do uh, to advance the mission of science, stewardship, uh, and service, uh, and all the work that you do. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's been an absolute privilege uh, to do this mission uh, shared with the world. And uh, we can't wait to see what we'll find uh, this mission. We still have two weeks here at sea and are going to be exploring many of the other treasures that are uh, in significant cultural and uh, natural sites that are part of this uh, really significant area in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much from all of us. Mahalo. Thank you. And just noting from our chat, we've had a lot of viewers express um, their gratitude. And um, we're really thankful that you're joining us here today. And um, we're really glad if this um, exploration can help give you some meaning, feel heard or valued, or give you some closure. So thank you very much for being in this um, reverent space with us today and um, letting us know your gratitude as well. We are very um, grateful for you joining us. We did complete a watch change recently, um, so I know there's still operations going on, but if we have some time, we could go ahead and just do a quick round of introductions for our viewers that might have tuned in recently, if that's all right with everyone. Um, and if any operations need to be conducted, we can always take a pause with that. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, my name is Kara again on the 12 to 4 watch. Uh, I serve as the Science Communication Fellow here on EV Nautilus, so helping to share those stories of exploration that we're uh, doing on this vessel. When I'm not here, I serve as the Seagrass and Mangrove Conservation Coordinator as part of the Guam Coral Reef Initiative. I'm really grateful to be on board with this amazing team of uh, people with all sorts of different perspectives and backgrounds. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it to my right. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Malia. Aloha, friends. I'm Malia Evans. I am the um, Oahu Education and Outreach Coordinator on behalf of Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, on board the Nautilus, I am serving as a resource monitor and also an educator. And um, I can tell you, it's just been such a pleasure to be around um, everyone on board who has such distinct um, expertise. And um, together, we make a great team. So, so happy to be here. And I will pass it to my right to Dr. Val. Thank you, Malia. Uh, my name is Val Finlayson. I am a postdoc at the University of Maryland, uh, specializing in geology, isotope geochemistry. Uh, I'm the other co-lead scientist on this expedition along with uh, Mike Brennan. 
And uh, normally I'm sitting 8 to 12 watch, but I'm sticking on for a little while longer today, uh, helping run support for uh, Mike and Hans. Thanks, Val. Uh, I'm Mike Brennan. I'm uh, all the other, the other co-lead scientist next to Val. Um, I'm the lead archaeologist for this mission and a maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. Um, and very excited that we've had the uh, c the weather conditions and an ability to come down to these sites the last couple of days. Uh, very grateful to be here. Hi, I'm Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist and maritime historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And uh, thanks for the support, Val. The 12 to 4 p.m. watch is all inclusive. You're more than welcome to be here with <laughs> us. Hello. Uh, this is Upashana. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Louisiana Lafayette working on the evolution of deep sea corals. And I am the biologist for the 12 to 4 watch. And it is a great honor to be a part of this expedition and especially these dives where I'm getting to learn from everybody uh, on the ship and on shore as well. And with this, I'll pass on to Taylor Ann. Hello, my name is Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger on this watch. Um, honored to be a part of this historical moment and hope that we can bring closure to the families that were involved in this battle. Um, yeah, very honored to be here with you all. Thank you. All right, thank you, Hugo. Thank you guys so much for um, sharing a little bit about yourselves and your roles on this vessel. Um, I'll go ahead and bring that to our front row. Uh, Jaina, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, aloha everybody. My name is Jaina Galvez. Um, I am the video engineer on this watch and I am originally from Hilo, Hawaii. Um, echoing what everybody else said, I am very honored to be here. So thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Jacob Westling, I'm from Eva Beach on Oahu, and I am the ROV engineering intern, helping out uh, our ROV pilot uh, with our expeditions here. Very excited to be here, very blessed to be in this space. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Dan with the ROV team. <coughs> Grateful to be here, excited to be exploring. Hello, I'm Mia. I'm serving as the navigator on the 12 to 4 watch. Just echoing what everyone said, I've been so grateful and honored to be a part of this group, it's working with a lot of diverse people and perspectives and having a lot of great chats on the on the lounge um, about being in these sacred places. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, and I know this is just a small part of our team. We have so many um, supporters and contributors uh, onshore as well. Uh, would any of the onshore team like to introduce themselves? They may be just stepping out of the ECC right now as we transition. Mia, how's our ship moving? Yeah. Going? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please jump in. Oh, well, just two of us left here in the ECC uh, for now, as our distinguished guests are uh, uh, in a program outside. But my name is Phil Hartmeyer, marine archaeologist for NOAA Ocean Exploration and co-lead scientist ashore, along with Dr. James Delgado from Search Incorporated, and joined here by uh, colleague Jeff. Yeah, I'm Jeff Morris. I'm an underwater archaeologist. Um, I was on the original 1999 expedition with uh, Navo and Nauticos um, when we found the first pieces of uh, uh, Kaga, um, the first pieces of the All right, thank you so much for um, sharing about yourselves with our viewers. Um, I'm not sure if we have any Japanese um, co-investigators as well tuning in. Uh, uh, can we pause before we do the... Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I just want to confer with Mike and Dan and Hans. Um, if you guys are ready for the next movements, 
Uh, I don't know if you're thinking we did a three two five the last movement, or we can do a three one zero. Actually, can we go um, just to the right, like ten meters? Okay. I, ideally, I'd like to be about five meters off the right. rack rather than over it. Right. Um, so if we could just do ten meters, whatever that direction is, to yep. to our right, um, we might be in a better position to look for damage to the hull from the torpedoes. Okay. Roger. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. That mud line is so high. We'll see if we can get down there. Right. Yeah, in addition to having the wreck so close to the, uh, the mud line, we're also seeing quite a bit of sedimentation on top of this, uh, the decks of the wreck. Um, I'd be curious to see if, whether or not that uh, changes at all as we move toward the bow. But it just tells you how much of the seafloor sediment was um, churned up uh, when the uh, ship impacted the seabed. Right. You know, I keep expecting bow and stern areas to be more prominent. Because that's so often what we see on other wrecks, but I don't think we're going to get it on this wreck. Do you think that's just a function of the condition of the ship or like impact mechanics? Well, partially it's it's the construction. So usually, you know, vessels, steel vessels are prominent at the bow and stern. This was a battleship turned into an aircraft carrier, like the Akagi. So as we know, the bow and stern are low, flat, original cruiser designs with superstructure added in the center. So they never did even have that prominent bow. Sorry. And we just had another member of our watch step in. Elsie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kara, um, Ali, and hello, everybody. My name is Elsie Tele, and I'm a supporting scientist here on our voyage. And when I'm not on Nautilus, I'm a researcher at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. Um, from the small island, of Palau, which also um, saw some of the action during World War II, so it's been a humbling experience to see um, from this side. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elsa, for reminding us of that. You know, we think about the layers of the history in this place that we are in Papahanaumokuakea, that we're in Po, and that we are looking at the sites of um, enor enormously violent events that happened in the 1940s. But I think you remind us that this also is part of a story of a, a pan Pacific and a global story uh, of history at that time. And it's important to remember everyone impacted by those stories. Yeah, thank you, Megan. And I think that's a really important point is that while we are in some of the most remote places in the in the world here in 
the mid middle of the Pacific, close to the point of land is close to 200 miles away. Um, closest population center is uh, over a thousand miles away. Yet so many people from so many different eras going back a thousand years ago to more recent times have a deep intimate connection to this place. And it's important to recognize that and, and drawing on those connections is really the first step to understand and to manage these really special places. And it's been an absolute wonderful experience to, to bring together uh, a really wonderful team, not just on the ship, but also on board and, and many of the public audiences that, that do have these intimate connections to this really special place. feel that seeing the comments uh, as we scroll down the page, you know, hello is from Guam and hello is from Kansas and hello is from Germany. So, uh, so present. If you are watching over on YouTube, we encourage and invite you to come over to NautilusLive.org where you can uh, learn more about the expedition, learn more about the Battle of Midway, learn more about the people that you're exploring with. Um, if you click on the team page or just scroll down the page, you'll see um, bios and profiles of everyone whose voice you hear right now, uh, the chance to learn about what brought them into this work, who they are on and off the ship, advice they'd give to people who are interested in a career like theirs. Um, I assure you will be blown away by getting to meet the incredible people that are here on the expedition. I certainly am getting to work alongside them. And just a recap for those tuning in, um, we have been looking at uh, different shipwrecks from the Battle of Midway. Uh, a few days ago, the USS Yorktown. Um, the other day, the Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi. And uh, on our current dive, we are looking at Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Kaga. Um, so Kaga was also built in the 1920s and retrofitted with a flight deck to accommodate heavier aircraft ahead of World War II. Um, it was uh, 812 feet long or 247 meters long. And during the Battle of Midway, 28 dive bombers um, from the Enterprise attacked the ship, hitting it with one 1,000-pound bomb and at least three 500-pound bombs. Uh, after receiving that damage, on June 4th, the carrier was scuttled, uh, so purposely sank by two torpedoes from the destroyer Hagi Kaze um, to prevent it from falling into enemy hands. Uh, it subsequently sank stern first. Um, and since then, in 1999, a joint expedition um, between Nauticos Corp and U.S. Naval and the U.S. Naval Oceanographic Office, um, were able to search this region um, and find, uh, using advanced re-navigation techniques, um, pieces of wreckage and uh, 
in October 2019, a comprehensive exploration campaign using acoustic mapping tools aboard the research vessel Petrol from a team uh, from Vulcan Incorporated and the U.S. Navy were able to find substantial remains. And then we are currently um, obtaining further information and archaeological assessments of this particular wreck. So this has uh, been um, adding to this story. And if you'd like to see uh, more information about our previous uh, wreck dives, we do have a few uh, photos on our social media you can look to. And uh, more information will be released um, in the coming days. So please stay tuned on our Nautilus Live social media pages and website. Kara, I just want to circle back. I'm, mm -hmm. I might have missed it as I was doing some math over here, but I think I cut off the Japanese um, peop the Japanese uh, archaeologists that were supporting us on shore from their um, introductions. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure they had a chance to speak now that we kind of have some yeah. time before the next ship movement. For sure. Thanks so much, Mia. Uh, so if we have any uh, Japanese collaborators also online, could you please uh, introduce yourself to our viewers? So I know it um, is just uh, getting into the morning in Japan, actually. So uh, maybe we'll check in later if uh, fellow Japanese co-investigators do tune in. That's perfect. Yes, um, one of the one of the elements of our telepresence technology and being able to contribute from all over the world is um, learning all the places where people are bringing the deep sea with them. And I think extra poignant here, all the places that um, folks are joining and um, holding these places in their hearts and in their minds while they go about their day to day. Uh, here on the ship, you know, we do this work 24 hours a day and watch shifts um, working around the clock, but always always a reminder and you know and a joy and a grounding for all of us to to know that people um, are engaged in this work and telling these stories while also being with their families and um, doing all the day-to-day -day things we, we recognize uh, living at sea is a challenge it just like it has been always for people to to be um, away from their families and their loved ones and so we we honor any of those memories that are associated with this place as well Nautilus, this is Russ Matthews. Go hey. ahead, Russ. Hey, Russ. Hi. Hey, guys. I think our Japanese colleague is trying to call in, but he's using the shore line rather than the uh, science party line. Oh. Um, video, is there a way to latch them on from here? Uh, can you uh, hear me? Hello, this is Randy. Oh, hello. Yes. Hi, Randy. Hi, Randy. Oh, okay. So oh, I should use this button here. So yeah, we gotcha. <laughs> I was talking. <laughs> Great. Sorry about that. Well, I guess I should uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm a well, maritime archaeologist, and I'm based in Japan. And my name is Sasaki, so that's my uh, Japanese uh, heritage. Uh, so my mother is American and my father is Japanese. So uh, this is kind of special uh, 
no place for me because I kind of represent both parties. So, uh, you know, it's uh, great to uh, be here. And, you know, I think uh, we should focus more on what happened after the war. Uh, we become, you know, both nations become so friendly after, uh, you know, all it has been you know, gone through. So, you know, it's uh, very uh, great to see this wreck and we can learn uh, a lot from uh, seeing this. So if you... Uh, no, have any connection, uh, no comment or anything from me, just uh, let me know. I should be able to uh, uh, stay online for the next uh, six, seven hours. So thank you. No, that's great. Thank you so much for calling in. It's, it's really great to have you here. And, and as you say, to have uh, connections to both sides. And, and you're right to, that we, you know, f we need to focus on what happened, you know, following this conflict where uh, these two nations are, are great mm -hmm. allies now. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, if we didn't make peace and friendship after that, then uh, I wouldn't be here. Right. I, I wouldn't <laughs> exist. So uh, it's a great, really thankful for what happened after the, uh, you know, wall. And some nations, you know, you, you cannot just get together uh, after all the conflicts. So, you know, all the nations around the world should uh, learn from our experience. And this, you know, having this monument here actually uh, let us know that even what, you know, we went through, we can have a friendship. Such an example for the world about the importance of, of dialogue and mending relationships and finding common space, which I think is something that Ocean you know, there's, there's no person on the planet who is not deeply connected um, and deeply reliant on a healthy planet and a healthy ocean. So it is certainly one of those things that reminds me of, of the ways that we are all so much more alike and so much more connected than, than at any time we could imagine being different. Thanks, Megan. Sorry to cut in. Um, Mike, Hans, are you ready for another move? Um, was that the move moving backwards? Where we were moving towards the right to get off. So I was yeah. going to call in another one. Yeah, the same thing, please. Same thing, yeah. Bridge nap. Can we please step one zero meters bearing seven zero degrees? Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for those comments. They're much appreciated. And, you know, despite the differences before and during World War II, um, all of these sailors and their ships now are in the same graveyard, so to speak, in what was a battlefield and what is now a, a peaceful monument. So there is that. Yeah, just wanted to also say thank you, Randy, for tuning in and sharing a little introduction of yourself and that um, personal connection. Uh, could someone on the archaeology team give us kind of like an overview for viewers just tuning in on this dive where uh, we have seen already on this um, shipwreck and over where we currently are and where we're heading? Yeah, so we um, we dived down uh, initially to uh, 5,400 meters or so 
um, came down on the uh, the port side amidships, and we moved along that edge to the stern and came around the stern. And we're now on the starboard side, um, a little aft still, but approaching midships. And we're moving forward towards the bow to take a look at the extent of the damage uh, and what remains uh, of Kaga. Uh, after that, we're going to be looking at the, the middle of the ship. We'll do a, a survey over that and then go out to um, a piece of a large piece of debris that's off the starboard side. Uh, a reminder, we're very deep, uh, one of the deepest dives that Nautilus has ever done and the deepest dive that Atalanta has done. And uh, so when we call in a, a, a move from the ship, it takes quite a while, like 10 to 15 minutes for the, those motions to, to come down this cable to the ROV. So we're, we're being very diligent and uh, methodical about how we, uh, how we move around. Thank you so much, Mike, for that explanation. And um, for anyone who is not as familiar with the nautical terms, uh, the port side is the left side when you're facing the front of the ship or the bow. Um, the starboard side is the right side. The stern is the back of the ship. And the bow is the front of the ship. And apologies if you've already gone over this a few times, but could you share a little summary of um, where Kaga, uh, how else Kaga was involved? I believe it was involved in Pearl Harbor and um, potentially some other battles in the Pacific before the Battle of Midway. And I was muted. What is this? Oh. Um. Yeah, so it was involved in um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, and let's see what else. It was involved in the invasion of Rabaul in the Bismarck Islands, um, and uh, the Marshall Islands. Uh, it was it was there for the Marshall Islands attack um, that the U.S. Uh, did right be, uh, in February of 1942. Um, let me see. It, w it doesn't seem like it was involved in the Battle of Coral Sea. I'm just looking over here real quick. Oh, the reason is because uh, the ship was damaged uh, it, during um, that attack and it entered dry dock in March uh, until early May. So it, it did miss uh, the Battle of Coral Sea and was it was put out um, for for Midway. Thank you for that uh, overview. Hi, Randy, this is Hans. You know, on the, on the topic that you raised about the larger relationship between uh, America and Japan, as you know, we, something we haven't touched on much <coughs> is the, the connection of this battle to Hawaii, the main islands. Um, of course, Pearl Harbor happened months before this, but at that time, and you're well aware, there were a number of Japanese, many Japanese, a significant percentage of the residents, population of the territory of Hawaii at that time were Japanese and Japanese American. And so for a long time, even before territorial status, even before the 
kingdom was taken over by American interests. In 1893, there was a relationship between the kingdom of Hawaii and Japan. And that special relationship, particularly from Hawaii and Japan, still exists today, of course. Many of my neighbors on my street are or were Japanese veterans, were and some are Japanese veterans of the war. And um, there's quite a story about that because when the attack happened, of course, it was very difficult suddenly for Japanese residents in Hawaii. And I was always taught that on the mainland, the relocation camps were established, but that the situation was different in Hawaii that since there were so many Japanese working on the plantations, they were not rounded up. That's not quite true. In fact, one of the newest national monuments is being established on Oahu now called Honouliuli, which is one of those relocation camps where people were rounded up. And that's a sad story, but uh, the Japanese in Hawaii and the Japanese Americans volunteered in great number for service. And despite that, despite the heroic histories of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and the 100th Battalion and their service in Europe, and again, when I was a younger, I was taught, well, they didn't serve in the Pacific. Well, that's also not quite true. Japanese translators were serving <coughs> with American forces in the Pacific. Despite that, during that catastrophe, their families maintain connections to their original heritage and homeland in Japan. And that, of course, continues with travel and family connections and relationships between the US and the state of Hawaii and Japan. So for a much longer period than the period of conflict during the war, there has been a growing close and friendly relationship between the two countries. Thank you, Han, so much for uh, sharing that because that brings to forth again what we have been discussing the last couple of days, that there's always a different narrative when it comes to the stories of war from a political side and the human side of the stories. And that's always important to remember that uh, these are people irrespective of whatever country, whatever land they belong from, that these are people who are involved and whose lives, whose families' lives have been destroyed in such wars and, ha and it still happens in the current world, but we always have to remember that 